Welcome to the Charlie Paparelli Show. I'm Charlie Paparelli. If you don't want to miss an episode, please sign up at paparelli.com. I am a 25-year angel investor here in the Atlanta technology community, and during that time, I've talked to hundreds of entrepreneurs who taught me how to start businesses and grow businesses in the technology community. Today, I'm going to share with you an interview that I did at the Angel Lounge at the Atlanta Technology Development Center at Georgia Tech. I interviewed a great angel investor, Bill Majette, former CEO of a public company who became an angel investor. He's got the heart of an angel. I think you're going to learn a lot today. Let's join this conversation in progress. Thanks. I am an angel investor, and it's the most fun I have. It's not the only thing I do. I actually, <laughs> I am invested in a couple of private equity funds, you know, barbarians at the gate, but, um, and <laughs> a couple of funds, and, and I enjoy that, but it's a very different animal. Uh, when I, uh, it, and there's a real discipline to angel investing that's equally disciplined to private equity. Uh, private equity is probably more forgiving uh, yeah, but it does. It doesn't it's, have quite the, the beta that that uh, early yeah. stage startup does at that point, right? But how did you? So you started. You were a CEO at Porex. That's right, and yeah, uh, and so that kind of is where you started to learn about investing in companies. I think wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was. I mean, when we it, my when I was running Porex. Uh, I made a lot of investments, joint ventures, licensing agreements, joint development agreements. And these were with some very large companies. Porex made the guts, the mechanical porous materials inside medical devices, bioscience, electronics, and the, uh, for the biggest companies you can think of. Okay. And this was all proprietary done in secrecy agreements. And, um, but we developed that and there was a lot of code development and a lot of licensing, a lot of JVs. And so those investments in technology transformed the company from a consumer industrial company to a medical bioscience electronics company. And That's and interesting. So you were in the midst from, of, you kind of stepped into uh, a company where you had to do deals. You right. were always on the lookout for how to get to more, what I'll say is a completed product. Well, that's exactly right. And I think, and you have to have a view to what you want to get to. And again, it's it's like the deals made are sim similar to uh, a founder saying, I have a dream. And what what am I going to be able to break into? What problem can I, what's unsolved problem can I solve? What can I do that's going to create something? You're dealing, when you were doing this though, Bill, were you actually dealing with bigger companies to do deals or with smaller innovative companies? Well, actually both. But when it was a code development agreement, larger companies. When it was acquiring technology or a company or doing a JV on a specific product development, they were typically smaller companies. And like occasionally, what's a smaller company that you would be acquiring? How big was that? Um, anywhere from three million to twenty million. Okay. What did you learn about? What did you learn about? Com smaller companies being a bigger company executive buying smaller companies. Uh, that you had to buy them. I'm coming from the medical device industry. I know that when we look at a big medical device company and we look at the products they put on the market, they bought most of those. They didn't develop it internally. Uh -huh. The difference was in a small company, they think fast, they think smart, they think more purposefully. In a large company, uh, the leadership, I think what you have in small companies is supercharged leadership. And that's true of companies I like to invest in, in a founder, because they're they're, much, they have to be nimble. Otherwise, they they're going to be dead, right? I mean, yeah. And they've got one hill to take. And but how do you do? But how do you I'm just I'm going to move over to the angel side pretty quickly here. Mm -hmm. But from um, st since you start on the corporate side, mm -hmm. you know, this is a, one of the things that we are hopeful for as angel investors is we always say is, oh, we got this three million dollar company. We can now sell it to a bigger company. Well, in a lot of cases, people, a bigger company looks at $3 million business and they go like, I don't know what, to, I mean, it's nice technology, but I don't know what to do with this. So how did you get to the point to say, how, I will buy this because I know how to integrate it? You feel like, what are the elements that had to be in place for you to be interested enough to buy a smaller company? 
Well, you have to know what you need to put on the market out the other end. So for example, we Porex, the first product was the tip on a magic marker. I think I told you that that was back in the 60s. And now Porex puts uh, the light reflectors on a space station. They're the materials for high throughput screening and drug discovery for COVID. They're surgical implants. And all of those were by going to the, the Porex market and solving an unmet need. But we were a big boat and we had our, we, we had to find those elements that would supercharge what we were able to do. And sometimes it's adding a product and sometimes it's adding a capability. But so when we made deals- There must with have been two valuation models in with regard oh, yeah. to that, right? Oh, Just adding oh. a product. Oh, sure. Team, and, and the company itself isn't really that important to you. You That's know, exactly if you're right. adding, if you're, if you, if you're adding process or something, then it's uh then you're really looking to buy a company, if you will. Or a great example of that would be like an antimicrobial compound. So we made materials that went into a lot of sophisticated applications and we needed to have an antimicrobial capability on those materials, mm -hmm. healthcare, electronics, especially those types of applications. So what we did was we found a great workable technology that would would work well with what we were already doing. The, the technologies we would purchase would be relatively cheap, a great deal for the person selling it. But for us, it would unlock a huge opportunity in the market because it was the missing link in a product. Got and it. I think that's so the view to, for, you know, and that's where when I talk to smaller companies, the ones that I invest in, yeah, well, and don't I, get there. You no got to tell me how you got from. Okay, so you leave Porex because I think that you were taken over, right? I mean, were you bought out by a private equity firm? Twice we did yeah. two exits, and, and then, then you eventually leave. Sure. And then you say, okay, so what's the most logical next step for somebody with your background? Where yep. did you go? Well, the first thing I did was go to a private equity firm. <laughs> and right. then I quickly discovered, you know, this is no fun. I don't want to do this, you know, have a portfolio company and re-engineer it and all that. There's nothing. You're at 30,000 feet. It's no fun. And then I, I did get together with some ex-colleagues and we set up Fairburn Equity and there were some targeted investments we made. But then I wanted to, to get into a world that got ground level with technology. And it's funny. And, and we've talked about it, Charlie, getting in the room. How do you get, like, I'm a big believer that you get in the room with the smartest people you can. And that's how you find your path. You don't, you can't think it up ahead of time. And, you know, even as I look on the screen or think about how all this started, the faces on this screen are the people that put me in the right direction. I, uh, when I was decided I didn't want private equity, I met Susan Shows over the Georgia Research Alliance. I've gotten involved there. I'm an advisor. I'm even in the venture capital fund board over there. And it's and been- you were there as the CEO of, of Porex? No, I'm sorry. I'm doing that just, at, this is after being CEO of Porex. Yeah. So this is where I get, so you do the private equity thing. And I think we've all gone that route because I know mm -hmm. I did. When I got out of corporate, I yep. said, well, I'll go into private equity. I mean, I understand, you know, how companies run. I understand markets. I understand how, you know, uh, process and- mm -hmm you know, how to make clean things up and get your expenses in line better, right? Make more money. So I buy it for 3X, I sell it for 5X, you know, it's a formula kind of a deal. Yeah. But how do you go from that to say, I'm going to go to GRA? You see, I mean, that, I, that, that's a big leap. Well, it is. And it's. And I think I, we all have our story, by the way, on how we did that. Mine's different than yours, but what's your story on how you did that? Well, mine is what I what I enjoyed most when I was in that corporate world. What did I enjoy? I enjoyed uh, taking novel technologies that solved something unique, something that would become vital and integral. I'm a big believer that pro the most successful products from a small company or large are things that are adopted, not purchased. And that was the business model we had at Porex. How do we market something that becomes adopted? It becomes integral, vital to the customer, something they can't do without, something's going to change the way they operate. That was the foundation of success. And then as I leave Porex, which I, you know, you go through a couple of buyouts and then you say, okay, it's time to look at something else. What did I like best? I like the technology. So from there, who works with early stage technology? I mean, I was working with it at Porex. It was the thing I like best, but who does that? 
outside of my big corporate world. Well, that's well, the key question. That was the yeah. most important question to ask at that time. Sure. And Who so, doesn't? so what answer did you come to? Well, I came to the <laughs> question that I needed to find out. And that's how, and and I it's sort of like a cascading event. I, you know, as I said, looking at the people on the screen, I, I went to GRA first. Susan Shouse is not here, but Susan Shouse, after having lunch with her and getting involved at GRA, she said, You have to meet Frank Ty. I said, <laughs> Well, I'd love to. So I met Frank. Where did that lead? I mean, when I think of how quickly all that unfolds, looking to be in a room with like-minded people mm. who I can learn from, who have been there, done that, I'm never the smartest guy in the room, and I always hired people smarter, smarter than me. But I met Frank. Where did that go? Well, one of the ways it went was I met you. I well, went tell me this, though. When you went to Frank, so first yeah. of all, why did she say to you, you need to meet Fried Thai? You because, said something to her that kicked something off in her mind that said Frank. So what did you say to her that made her made you want to meet Frank? Well, I said, uh, this is, she, you know, we talked about Porex. And she said she knew Porex. She knew what I did there. And she said, you can help us at GRA. And these oh, are early okay. technologies coming off of campus. And in that conversation, as I expressed what I'm interested in, that I've done the corporate thing. I'm interested in getting a ground level on things that are really fascinating. Ah, things okay. Things that can make a difference, things that where I can see a difference. And she said, you know, the ATDC, you got to talk to Frank Ty. And that, that was how that so what happened when you talk to Frank. So you go to Frank and Frank, uh, Frank's a very generous, generous with his yeah. time. And he's a gracious man. He said, how can I help you? Well, what'd you tell him? <laughs> I said, <laughs> I don't know. How can I help you? And it's <laughs> I just, we talked about what, what I did. You know, I walked in. Frank gave me a tour. We talked about the ATDC. And I thought, wow, there is a place like this. I thought I'd landed in Oz. It was <laughs> terrific. I love and it. With the, the, the hum and the buzz and everything going on, which I hope and pray we return to very soon. But and I thought, this is terrific. And he, we walked down the hallway and he pointed at doors and said, you know what's going on in there? You know what's going on in there? You know what's going on in there? I thought, this is fabulous. And he said, and there's some companies you could help with. So from there, Frank set me up as a mentor, introduced me to a couple of companies. I love being a mentor of all the things I do. I love it the most because I work with inspired founders who are trying to make a difference. I don't make any money at it. And, but when I go in, I'm very committed to it. And I think that's very important in a mentor. You commit to it. It's not a hobby. This is dead serious when you're a mentor. Stay in your lane. Bring in other people. The focus is to help that founder become famous at what they're trying to do. And, and that is what the ATDC, what, I, what was so appealing about it. One of and the so, experiences, though, that I had, though, Bill, is uh, when you show up, you know, uh, they don't see you really as someone who can help them as much as they see that someone who has money, you see. So a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes, well, I shouldn't say, maybe this was, I'm, I'm prejudicing the question, but this is my experience is early 90s, okay? People would see the money and not, not the experience, okay? And and when the, what they would do is they, they really had this general philosophy that just give me your money. I know what to do with it, okay? Well, you you're know, saying I, it's different. You're saying that this meant they're looking for mentorship. Yes, they are. And the money will come. You know, I'm a big believer that money follows success. If you go out, yeah. you know, we've talked about it. If you're always out trying to structure some deal and the company doesn't succeed. It doesn't matter. So you need success first. These founders need help. And by the way, my background is in medical device, healthcare technologies, and uh, materials. And so that's where I got involved. And so I've, I'm happy to say I work with about uh, nine or 10 companies right now that are ATDC companies. I'm the board of three of them. And so I got involved with those because I was there to help. What does it and mean? What does it mean when, you know, that's just something that we talk about. And Glenn's big on this too. It was like, it's, this is a angel investing, you know, is a contact sport. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, with that in mind, you know, when you say I got involved, 
You know, that can mean a lot of different things. What does involvement look like for you in these companies as a mentor, first of all? Well, and as an, okay, as a mentor, an ATDC mentor, I'm there to be objective and helpful, committed and invested in their best interests. And quite okay. frankly, I've told them, and we do the, the ATA, I'm heavily involved in the ATA. It's a super organization and a lot of us are mentors. I, we do the investor readiness class. We participate in that. I get up there in front of them and, and I tell them things that are in their best interest, not the investors. How should they look at raising yeah. money? So that's how I approach mentoring. What's the, highest, what's the highest value that you bring to a company as a mentor? The highest value? You mean yeah, me where people, where you have these entrepreneurs, you could just see yeah. somebody when you really help them with something. They're yeah. like, you can see they just, there's this, this pause, right? It's like, oh my God, you're introducing me to this client or you're introducing me, you know, to this, my new VP of sales or you're, you know, there's some big burdens that a mentor can, can, can uh, lift from an entrepreneur. So what, what was your, what was the thing they looked to you and said, oh man, that bill's great. I think what I try to focus on with them is, um, strategic planning and business development, staying the course. I seldom walk into a company and know the technology better. Okay. I'm not going to know the market better. Those are the things I'm not going to know. But I do know what success looks like. And that's where not having been an entrepreneur, but having been a corporate executive, I know what it looks like when you get there. And I look how do at- I go? So how do you go from being a mentor? You know, you talk to Frank, he introduces mm-hmm. you to some companies, you start giving them some advice. Mm -hmm. listening to where they are. Seems like you're a product market fit kind of guy, which I think is a big, uh, is really important uh, skill for Angel to have. And of course, to be good at product market fit, you got to understand that market, (laughs) right? Which you did. So uh, how do you go from being that mentor to then being an investor? Well, I think that being a mentor makes you a better investor because you, you understand better the mind of the founder and the entrepreneur. It all builds. And so it's not just the people. So it's a relationship building time, that mentorship. It is a relationship building time. And there have been cases where I've directed people towards those who can invest. And there are a couple of occasions where I invested. It was not my intent when I was going in as a mentor, but I think the main thing is not even a relationship. It's, a, it's an awareness. It's an understanding you develop. And that's just by being part of an ecosystem. It's part of being in the room with the smarter people. Okay. And then as a mentor, which I take very seriously to help companies get to their best endpoint, that helps me in, you know, as an investor. And that investor, you know, you think of how all that unfolds. I, I'm actively involved in the ATA. And the reason is, you can't be everywhere. You got to pick certain rooms to put a lot of energy into. But that came from meeting Frank, which meant I met you and I met Larry McHugh, who said, come to an ATA meeting where I met Joe and Sandy. And I, there, I'm on the board there. What other connections through, well, even the Angel Lounge, uh, uh, Glenn Bachman's the one who said, come out to a Thai event where I met Paul Lopez and went down that path. You know, I mean, so you get connected, you get into these smart rooms. But which, this is pretty interesting, though, is you, you just, uh, you were quick to be available and to jump in. When somebody said, go to Thai and meet, you know, let me introduce you to Paul. You didn't just shake his hand and walk away. Right. You're asking the same thing you asked Frank, which is, how can I help you? Right. Absolutely. So you, you're available. You're, you're engaged in this thing. You're out there. That's a big, that's, that was a big, that's a big part of what made you successful moving from one career, which is poor X into angel investing is you're taking this pretty darn seriously. That's right. And that's absolutely right. And, and I look at it that way. I mean, as a retirement plan after poor X, I, I think I told you, I can't fish and I'm a lousy golfer. So got to find something else. And this was something I was had a genuine interest in. And yeah, I put myself out there. I wasn't playing hard to get. I went out and said, and I knew I may have run a big company, but this I didn't know. So I went out to people and said, I don't know. I'm here. I want to participate. You know, and, and that opens the discussion. 
and it's a terrific community. Look at how that does. I mean, there's another way to do angel investing is to say, yeah, I ran a company and I've got some money. Hey, Frank, it's great meeting you. When you find, you know, an interesting deal, give me a call. That's one way to do it. You didn't mm-hmm. do that, right? And this is no. why you you really jumped in the deep end quickly and said, I'm really here to help. Well, yeah, and 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 I'm happy to say there are a lot of like-minded people. Now, I'm a serious investor. Don't get me wrong. I am. And I've got 15 investments now and 14 of them float. <laughs> One does not. But of the 14, uh, seven of them, uh, there's one exit in that, and there's six that have had an up round. And this is over a fairly short period of time, you know, five years. But I and I'm very pleased. And how long have you been doing this? Yeah, I, I've made some investments earlier than that, but in earnest since I left Porex. Yeah, it's been about five years. How many investments and, have you made since meeting Frank? Since meeting Frank, let's see. Um, the Swampland one doesn't count, right? Yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> so uh, since meeting Frank, because that goes way back, I'll say uh, 12. All right. Well, there you go. That just shows the acceleration of it all that, and the seriousness. And, and what's your average when you, you know, we had our average investments that we make on these things. What kind of, uh, what do you look to, what kind of round, what size round uh, do you feel comfortable participating in? I'll participate in any size round. I think that um, what I like to do, I like to understand what I'm investing in. I like it to be purposeful. I like it to make a difference. And I like, and I'm a big believer in the founder. So I like to know what I'm investing in. I don't just throw money behind something because it's been put out there. How big, you know, generally speaking, because of what you're doing and the people that you're doing it with, there must be sort of an average round size that it really turns out to be, even though you're saying you'll invest in anything. I, I'd say the average round size would be anything as small as uh, uh, half a million. I'm, oh, this is what you mean, the amount that the founder is raising from there. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The founder. I'd say half a million, anywhere up to five. Up and, to five million. Uh, yeah. And you've depends. been in all those rounds. Yeah. It depends where they are. There's a couple of those. Does and it I, matter how big the round is and how much money you put in or you keep putting in about the same amount of money? I do. Um, I put it. I generally start at fifty. You start at that, fifty, okay? That, and, and so I like it to be a material investment. I like to be on the radar screen of the founder, and I like to be able to get the phone answered when I call. So, why did of the twelve investments that you make? Why did uh, what did you say you were on three boards? You know, yeah. why do they? Why did you choose to be on the boards? Or well, why did they choose you to be on the boards? Well, it's it's there are different stories on each of them, it, but uh, that in each of those, in two of them, I made an investment. One of them, I did not make an investment. I came through GRA, and that's Quest Renewables, which is an ATDC company. Okay. And the other two, I had an investment. One was through uh, Tech Square Labs and GRA, and another one through ATA. So, and those are larger investments. These those are medical are devices. Thing. A follow on. No, no, actually, uh, Oncolens is software. They're in the news and okay. they have just done a seven and a half million dollar raise, done their Series A. That's right in the news. And Carbice just did a $15 million raise. And it's a $50 million post money. That's carbon nanotubes, which is again materials. So I'm devices and materials. So those are in comfort zones for me. And I went in and in each of those, uh, I've started uh, uh, higher than 50. And oh, I'm well okay. above that now because I've done follow on rounds with those. How much higher than 50 were you on those? Uh, I'm up to 250. Okay, great. So, so, so what I, serious investments. They're serious investments, and I'm close to them, and I have high levels of confidence in them. And I angel investing, I enjoy, and I don't always look for a follow on, but in those cases, where we have a company that's getting real traction and I get very comfortable with it. And the founder is superb, which is the case like an Anko Lens and uh, Anju Matthew and mm-hmm. uh, Baracola over at, at Carbice. Again, it's a jockey that sleeps on the horse. And that is, that's the magic ingredient for me. And that's the part of investing I really understand. Again, I'm not going to. Have you ever gotten to, 
uh, what'd you say? A jockey that what? Sleeps on his horse. Sleeps on his horse. Sleeps, you said, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, I also say of a founder, a founder has to be able to die on the hill. I, it, because oh, of all there you the, go. Okay. I don't know in a business, but because of all the things I can't see and I can't, you can do a hundred hours of diligence, you won't get there. You're, I find the ingredient, that common denominator is a founder who's a leader. You know, so we all look at founders and we want a manager, we want accountability, we want yeah. all of that. We all want accountability, but just like salespeople, the best salespeople are the ones who are crappy with paperwork, but know how to nail the sale. And with founders, the leaders, those people who can't sleep until it's done, it may be a little messy along the way, but boy, they get there. And and so that's that to me is that's central. Investing. How did you did you ever in all of these deals that you did? Did you ever actually um, create a term sheet, or were you always someone who came in when there was a term sheet? Um, I participated in a couple of term sheets. Now remember going back to Porex term sheets. You know, I did it till I was bleary eyed sometimes. Yeah, you were writing yeah. term sheets there, yeah, right? That's what I'm saying. So you go to angel investing, and that's a whole, that's, you know. Yeah. And it, I, I guess it, what I'm asking is have you been a lead angel that said, okay, I, this is a good deal. I'm going to yeah. write the term sheet, negotiate it with this guy, and then I'm going to go help him raise money. Have you done that? No, I have not. And there's, okay. and there's a reason for that. And, and that is because, uh, I, that, that I'm, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't want to say smart enough. I might be smart enough. I'm not experienced enough to do that to the benefit of the founder. And here's what I mean by that. Hmm. There are people who will lead around. I learned from those people. I'm an, I've learned, I've participated. I mean, even through ATA, when we syndicate and there's like BIP on Oncolens or Venture South and other companies, and we hope with Nelson one day at, at Kinetic. I mean, so you, we, I go in and join, go with ATA and we syndicate, we participate in the construction of term sheets and we'll syndicate, but I haven't led that because I have more to learn before I step out in front. And- Do you see yourself doing that in the future? Sure. You do? Sure. Yeah, I think I, I, hopefully I get smarter every day. And I think that now, as I say that it would be uh, in cooperate, I'm not going to go out and do it on my own because uh, I shouldn't say that if I find the opportunity, I might, but I do like getting out in front of it. Now I like working with the ATA, which is a terrific platform to get great deal flow in a sophisticated process. We have a very disciplined process we participate heavily with these early stage companies in term sheets. We generally say, and I love working with ATA, we generally say we don't want to lead it, but we'll co-lead. Now, will we lead in the future? Will I lead in the future? Probably, but I can't sit here and tell there, you. Are there I'm, particular terms that you find that you're attracted to and terms in a term sheet that you're repelled by? Well, um, there are... For me, if I look, there's I, I would the founder you can't put into a term sheet, but that's the biggest thing I look for. When I get into terms and you get into the financials, I look at it this way. If the business business intent, the strategic intent is there and the use of funds reflects what's going to get the founder from where he is to where he needs to get to. That's where I really dig in because I do believe that money follows. So it's use of funds. It's not the structure of the deal that's going to make a difference for me. And that's what I like to see in that term sheet. I want that term sheet to hold that accountability because, you know, I've seen people do deals and get every detail buttoned down <laughs> and the business doesn't succeed. Well, that's a bad deal. Now, if you get into a good business, and you don't have the perfect financial structure, you're still going to have a good outcome. But if you have a good business, you know, these people that seem to have good businesses all of a sudden have stratospheric valuations, you know, how do you, how do you reconcile uh, to a valuation if, uh, if you're uncomfortable with the term sheet and its value? 
if it's a valuation, there's nothing you can do. You can negotiate with the founder and you, one thing I do say, and I didn't invent this, it's just good advice from most good angel investors. You tell the founder, don't make your money off the angels, make your money in the subsequent rounds. Your angels are there to help. They're there to help get you off the ground. What a great line. And so, well, (laughs) I, I I steal every line I have, so I don't can't tell you where it came from, but it's it's just an awareness of being in a room full of smart people. That's really it. And so you try to talk to a founder and you say, uh, if their valuation's out of whack, it's not going to work. And then then it comes down to use of funds. The use of funds discussion usually gets the founder back to a logical place on valuation. And if you can't get there, you can't get there. So, you know, what about what about what do you see? You know, you talked about the importance of the entrepreneur being a leader, willing to die on the hill. You could just feel that from them, really loves the market they're in, all of these elements, which are so important Um, Mm -hmm. and good stewards, I would think. Right. I mean, you're looking for that, too. Not somebody who just takes money and just can't wait to spend it. You know, they have an actual milestone that they're pointed at. How do you, what about the other investors? You know, as an angel investor, we're not usually solo investors. There's other people associated with that. How do you get yourself, uh, how do you, how do you vet the other investors so that you get to a point where you say, yeah, I like these people. This is a good group to be with. Is that important to you? Oh, sure. Sure it is. Because, uh, and I'll give you a good example. And I'll tell you, BIP. We invested with OncoLens, ATA, with OncoLens. Uh-huh. We kind of co-wrote the term sheet. It mattered that we could go forward looking. BIP is a bigger organization. And it mattered that we were like-minded. We each had a seat on the board. And that uh, going forward, where there would be subsequent rounds, BIP was going to be at the table, and we weren't. That's only logical. So were we aligned with the way BIP wanted to approach this investment on Colens? We were, and it's been a success. And okay. you know, I give a real tip of the hat to BIP. They did what they said they were going to do. And the approach, Mark Buffington is the guy who uh, sits on the board there and has a great interest in the business. And as angel investors, we will benefit now from that partnership going forward. So it, it matters a lot. And then even within the angel group, when we get together and put money in, we have a disciplined screening process at ATA and we put companies in front of the members and those that are interested, it's an individual choice. They get together as a group. And um, a couple of guys in that group, Joe Beverly and George Connaught, and they're just scientists on analyzing the value of business and and they help, and that's their part in teaching everybody else. Like, say, have you stuff. ever cut? A, have you ever put a group together or people that said, "I'm interested"? You're going to have different people. You're going to, like you said, you're going to have a Joe Beverly that really wants to get into it, and you're going to get into the leadership and all that, right? And the entrepreneur and the market. But then you got these hangers on, right? Oh well, if those two guys are in it, you know, there was the old saying with Sig Mosley. You know, if Sig was in a deal, this was years ago before you, while you were still at Porex. When Sig was in a deal, I'm talking 15 years ago, it was like, whew, this group of people would come behind it and they just put money in and they would say, hey, Sig, how's it going? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I would imagine you got that side of it too, that you're becoming well, more of a lead because people prefer to be less engaged and more passive. Well, are, there, are you comfortable with those people? Absolutely. And I think it depends where you find them. Like, again, if it's in the ATA, there are newer members, less familiar, they're yeah. learning, they have something to add. But in a larger group, for example, when we get into some business that's in that's social media dependent or some other technology, FinTech or something that I'm not familiar with, they weigh in. I weigh in in areas that I'm comfortable I with. Got you. That's what makes it work. When it's outside of the ATA where there's an investment, I, these are people I know, and I like to know I, what their motivation is, what their philosophy is. And I, I believe a founder needs to control a business through the first couple rounds, not let the institutional money take it over. Yeah, and I get that. So, and, and will they, will they, 
One of the things that we say, and we'll kind of run a little bit, I want to leave time for Q&A here, is one of the things that we, one of the principles that we have, and you're pretty clear on that, uh, this is at Angel Lounge, is that you should be investing in what you know, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and that's what you have pretty much stayed to. You said, look, I know what I know, and I know what I don't know, and I don't speak up when I don't know. OK, <laughs> so I want to, as you put it, put myself in the room with the right people. The second thing that uh, that we talk about is that you should have an investment thesis. Mm -hmm. All right. How would you summarize? Uh, you've invested now in, like you said, 12 deals or so. How would you how would you summarize your investment thesis for for us? Well, the overall thesis is the business case the founder and the financial structure, the financial structure to support the first two. And what I like to invest Tell in- Tell me what the business case? Yeah, the business case, Yeah, the founder and the financial structure, which supports the first two. I got and it, okay. So for the thesis, I don't like, if you, if you invest in, if you follow the competition, I told people this over the years in my career, if you follow the competition, you make noise. If you lead, you make sales. And so I invest in a leader. What's a, what's a standard of performance? That's something that's vital or integral, something that will, people will adopt and change their behavior to use. That, that's what I look for. I also look for something that's purposeful and does good and that I can be proud of in my association. But, you know, it's, it's really about customer, what, what will be adopted and markets that are really well-defined. You know, we all see these bubble charts with giant markets. Well, what's actionable? What can you really do? And then um, when I find that, I got an iPhone sitting here on the desk, that thing replaced my camera, my sound system, my computer. I mean, it's amazing. That is a standard of performance. So that, that's key. And then with the founder, yeah, it's, it's the, 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 the founder who will die on the, on the hill. That's the key. And the leader, you, we all like managers. We all love accountability. But if you don't have a leader, you don't have it. What's the underlying motivation of that founder? And why are they doing it? And why do they have to win at it? And you know, that's what, if that's not there, I, I don't go in because if that about is the financial structure, then, well, the financial structure, I'm comfortable with notes and safes and shares and everything else. There's a lot of debate around that. I like a financial structure that supports the business. There are cases where, and I, there are a lot of people at ATA that debate this and say, I, I like equity. I don't like convertible notes. Right. I like what will help the founders succeed because then I'll succeed. And so um, as long as it's actionable, you know, it's, it has to be a logical model that is achievable, or at least we can assume is achievable. You know, it's funny. You get founders. You do, I love you do, that. When you do investments, though, and you said the $50,000 is when you'll invest, yeah. sometimes it'll be more. Yeah. You, uh, and, but then you made a comment that I don't do follow-ons in some cases. Is When you put a 50 up, do you expect to put a, another 50 in on another angel round? or? Well, sure. It depends on the progress of the company. It could be that. It could be more. It could be zero. But the main thing is, the financial structure of the deal. I'm saying when I go to the outset. What percentage, what that, percentage, this is a personal question, but what percentage, as you look at this as uh, being your business now, in effect, I would call you a professional angel investor at this point, since you're really spending your time on it. It's not a passive activity for you. Is what percentage of um, your net worth just, and you might not have done this in a hard way, but maybe in, even in a soft way that sort of you sit there and say, this percentage of my net worth is really going to go to this. And I'm not saying you're fully invested today on that, but is there some number in your head in that regard? No, not really. Uh, I think that um, I don't want to uh, uh, end up in the poor house because all my <laughs> angel investments went south. So I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen. But no, I don't have a specific number. I find it uh, this is a purposeful activity. And, and so when I get out there, I'm 
trying to do good. You know, it's funny, Larry McHugh said to me years ago, I think Larry's probably on the call. He said, you can do well and do good. And I thought that was brilliant. Now I found out that those were actually the words of Benjamin Franklin, but Larry's the one that first said it to me. So, but, the, and, and so that's what I'm after. I don't really have an end point. I don't have a cap. I'm not a fund with an investment period. So I just keep going at it. And I like to get behind the dream of a founder, if it's addressable. Now I will say you get people when, when a founder says, I have a dream, you're hoping he's gonna tell you his vision. You're hoping it's not the title of his financial slide. Yeah. No, I see what you're saying. Absolutely right. My dream isn't that I'm gonna be a multimillionaire. My dream is that I'm gonna change the world, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's more what you were looking for. But I think that is the heart. Um, you know, I've got so many questions. I don't want to leave this open for other people. So uh, I'm going to I'm gonna open this up now to some of our um, other angel loungers here to see if they have questions for you. But uh, you do have the heart of an angel and you summarized it well by saying, we need to do well and we need to do good. And that really is what angel investing is all about. Bill, thanks. You know, how about everybody? What do you got for, uh, for Bill here? You got questions? Hey, Charlie, I just wanted to quickly say, Bill is the prototype for me for the perfect mentor. He, so many people say to me, and this may resonate with some of you, I'll keep it really short. Yeah. People say, oh, I came to ATDC, tried to be a mentor, it didn't really work out. I didn't know how I fit in. I didn't know what to do. Bill came in as a servant, sort of, I'm going to give first. No expectation. Not that I'm going to write a check. Not that you're going to pay me. Not that I'm going to get options. Not that I'm going to get advisory shares. I'm just going to come here and help where I can and learn. And he was so valuable, people wanted him on his board. And then the organically, the investment happened. So he spent he spent mm -hmm. hours and hours with teams that nothing ever happened. And he moved around and was helpful where he could be and became an incredible resource. And then just naturally, organically, the investments happened, the board opportunities happened. But he didn't come to it with a mind, what am I going to get? Yeah, what's in it for me, right? I mean, that's a that's a great observation that the that the investment in a relationship, a good relationship, and a good business will happen organically. I think that's wonderful, Frank. Thanks. That's really good. Anybody else? I have a question for Bill. Bill, first of all, how are you? Good to see you again. Good to see Paul Janetsky here. How are you? Um, so, you know, your expertise in the medical device space, we share that Bill uh, and I both were at CR Bard and played poker. And I suppose one of the times <laughs> you don't want to be, you don't want to be in a room where you're not the smartest is in a poker, uh, in a poker environment, right, Bill? So I'm just teasing them. Bill and I were like the first guys out and we would sit there and smoke cigars and drink beer and watch everybody else play poker. But, but at any rate, the question is regarding your investments. Um, so medical devices and materials, in, in given that you're in some groups that you're seeing all sorts of other types of investments, are you are you willing to you know go into fintech, go into some of these other areas that you don't know as well, or are you less likely to do that um, because you know of your investment thesis or because of your experience? That's a great question, and yes, I am willing to go into some other areas. I think the the main thing is you start in an area you're familiar with so you can test whether or not your insights are usable. You know, you've got like, I, I've got my approach to business and what is successful and the importance of a founder. And it's easiest to test that against a market you understand well. So yeah, and medical devices, which, and healthcare, that's still where I tilt. But no, I, as I get more comfortable with the angel investing model, the business model, and the stresses and strains that are part of being an angel investor. As you know, when we were CR Bard, we had the money, we just had to make a choice. With angels, use of funds, use of funds. And, and then looking at that end point are, and, and how they're planning to get there. I get comfortable in some other market areas as a result, I try not to get, what is the expression? I don't want to get over the tips of my skis. Um, I'm methodical and deliberate in what I do. Uh, but, um, uh, but yeah, I'm definitely comfortable. And by the way, the key there too, you get in a room full of smart people. 
and who can who can make it comfortable, who can answer some of the questions that are out there. So no, I'm I'm definitely uh, interested, in, and I have gotten outside of healthcare. Thanks. Good to see you again. Have you? You too, Paul. And uh, let's do something, but not play poker. Okay. <laughs> you got it. One of the things that you have, Bill, it seems to me, is uh, you've got a very unique background for this. Okay. So you've got a sales background. You have an op, and, and, and this is in technology, a sales technology background, if you will. Okay. Scientific. You've got an operations background and you have an acquisitions background. Is that what really makes you successful? Uh, no, I think it's the geography degree I got in university. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd have an answer for that. <laughs> no, do you know, you know what I think does, I think, and this is, uh, uh, to the degree there's a success. I, I'm just, I love the technology. I love the technology focus. I'm curious and I'm inspired. I'm not inspired easily, but I'm inspired by the founders of a lot of these companies, not all of them. I mean, there are people in it for a hobby and I'm not interested in supporting somebody's hobby, but I mean, the really driven founders who have a unique technology that has the potential to be integral and vital to what people do, what they adopt into their life and the way they operate their business. That's, that's the key. And when that's there, I think that becomes the common thread. I think when you approach anything that way, even in a corporate environment, um, things start to make sense. Hmm. And if you're inspired by it, you're going to learn. And uh, if you're not inspired, you're not. That's that's me anyway. Well, Bill, you, you this has been just fabulous, you know, and you are an inspiration. But I love that you ended with that and that you said, I love the technology, right? I am curious. And you said, I'm inspired, but you're inspired by the founders and who they are and what they're trying to achieve. And that is inspirational, but you bring something that Frank talks about so importantly to the table, which is, hey, I'm here to help. If there's an investment opportunity here, great. If there's a mentoring opportunity here, great. If we, if it's a one, if it's a, a one call advisory meeting, great. You're not forcing anything. So it is all organic and it all has to fit and work together. And that is the, I don't know how better to express angel investing. So congratulations on getting into the game by leaving corporate and becoming an angel investing and slipping right by all that private equity stuff. So <laughs> God's put us in our community and we are very, very grateful that you're here with us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Charlie. And it started out at the Angel Lounge and at ATDC. It did? Oh, wow. How about that? That's fantastic. So thank you, Bill. Uh, that's the end of our of the interview. And, uh, and uh, I just want to say that you know, Brad is at the very beginnings here of trying to make this startup angel matchmaking work. And I really would encourage that we take on Bill's view, okay, which is to get involved and to give our time. And uh, let's see, let's help Brad be successful at doing this matching, even if it winds up to be more mentoring matching than it actually winds up being investment matching. But those investments, you just got to trust, as Frank said, they'll come. But we have to take that first step. They're not going to come to us. We have to come to them and we have to invest our time first and foremost. So thank you all for being a part of Angel Lounge. Our next meeting is going to be on February 18th, and uh, it will be uh, it will we'll try to make it as equally as an exciting, fun, and informative as we did with Bill here. Um, but I can't promise that because Bill's such a great man. So thank you all for being a part of Angel Lounge. I wish you all a good day and a good month. Continued good investing.